Hello, Mr. Bell here with Bayonet Charge. Now, if you look at the poem, the first thing you notice at the top is the poet's name. So let's do a little bit on the poet himself. In this case, it's Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes was not a war poet because he didn't fight in the war. His father fought in World War I, so it could be partially based on his father's experiences. in World War I. Now Hughes is imagining these experiences because his father was not talkative about his war experiences as most men who fought and suffered in the First World War weren't afterwards so he's imagining these experiences. One other thing that it's useful to know about Hughes is that his poetry is linked a lot with the countryside and he often focuses on the violence of nature and we certainly see aspects of this in this poem so I'm just going to pop a note of that at the top as well. Violence of nature. So, um, what nature is violent here? Well, nature is something that actually gets destroyed in this poem rather than nature being violent itself. But he may be exploring how human nature is inherently violent. Right, let's begin with the poem. Let's look into it straight away. The title is fairly self-explanatory, isn't it? Bayonet Charge. In the First World War, men would fix bayonets onto the end of their rifles, would climb out of the trenches and then would charge. The only thing I may comment on with this is the word charge suggests something quite exciting and dynamic and um, almost kind of positive really I suppose. But this soldier's experience of this is not like that at all. It's a really quite a gloomy portrayal of war. But more than gloomy it's probably emphasised by confusion as much as anything. Okay, let's begin. So the poem begins, suddenly he awoke and was running, raw and raw seemed hot khaki, his sweat heavy, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge. Now, I've said already that this, this poem's a lot about the confusion of war, and there's a few words I just want to pick out for confusion. I'm just going to look at that opening word there, the adverb suddenly. So the, uh, the writer, Hughes, begins with this adverb suddenly, starting in the middle of an event, in media res. If you want the spelling of that, it's media, as you would spell it, and then reas is R-E-S. It's a Greek term, means starting in the middle of something. So you start us in the middle of an action here. Other things that may suggest confusion, in the third line, we have the verb stumbling. Now this is a bayonet charge. There's quite a contrast between the positive, forward-thrusting, dynamic nature of the word charge and the slightly confused sense created by the verb stumbling which doesn't suggest like a, a wonderful patriotic vision of war it's someone confused about what's going on so the soldier gets up and he's charging towards this green hedge and that's all the enemy are ever referred to in this poem they're never given a name at all they're never personified the enemy are simply a green hedge just gonna put the enemy there you um that dazzled with rifle fire, hearing bullets smacking the belly out of the air. Now, as the soldier moves forward, he's confused, yes, but there's also an increasing sense of violence throughout this poem. If we look at again at the verb that's used here, we've got the phrase, bullets smacking the belly. What a great quote to remember that is, bullets smacking the belly. It's got all sorts of things happening within Hughes's language here. We've got the alliteration of bullets and belly. That's what we call plosive alliteration, p, b, k, and d sounds. So the use of the plosive alliteration, bullets smacking the belly, really gives us the sounds of bullets flying and hitting everywhere. And you can imagine the sound of bullet break, doom, doom, as it actually hits someone like that. But the bullets aren't hitting people, they're bullets smacking the belly out of the air, so it's almost as if the air itself is being killed, such as the violence of the war. Another word we could look at here, which is interesting, is of course this verb here, smacking. Quite a contrast with the lack of certainty in the earlier verb stumbling, we've now got the certainty of this violent verb smacking there. So. He finds himself awake, he's charging forward, um, he's not particularly good at it, uh, the whole thing becomes increasingly terrifying, and then we have three lines here, he lugged a rifle numb as a smashed arm, an interesting simile there, because of the use of as. 
The rifle is as numb as a smashed arm. Maybe this might suggest the sheer fatigue of war and how tiring it is. It could suggest how the rifle feels unnatural to him, that he's not really a born killer. You know, you may have this idea of a soldier having the gun almost as an extension of their arm, as if, if they're really trained killers. This, one's clear, this man's clearly struggling with the whole concept of being a killer. That leads him to question some things, because we have this interesting phrase here, this, the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye. Now, a patriotic tear, I don't think we should view this as a tear of sadness. We should view this as a tear almost of pride, I believe. It's a patriotic tear. He's so proud to go and fight for his country. But Hughes writes, the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye. Now, that's the key thing here is the verb again. And if we have a look at it, Hughes has used the past tense of this verb here. Just make a note of that. Past tense. Because this soldier's patriotism is now being questioned for the first time. Instead, this patriotic tear is sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. It's not a thing of, of pleasure and celebration. It's a thing of violence. Another simile, sweating like molten iron. And the first of our... Um, possibly the first of our mechanical images, images in the poem. Because there is a contrast in this poem. A contrast between machinery or mechanised war and nature. Machinery and nature. Almost as if the machinery that came around as a result of the Industrial Revolution then leading to the First World War is de as devastating to nature, human nature as well as the natural world, as, um, you know, as it is to, well, to people, really. The middle stanza is really confusing, so I'm going to come back to that at the end, because I actually want to jump forward this concept of the, of the machinery starting to en enter here. I'll come back to this. In this middle stanza, if you need to know what's going on, it's the soldier being very puzzled about why he's doing what he's doing. I'm going to jump to the end. So it starts with, he's in the action, and he's... Um, He's not very good at it, and he's a bit frightened, and he starts to doubt it. The middle stanza's almost sheer confusion. The final stanza is a sense of war being absolutely devastating to life. There's a, the hare gets killed, as we can see. Threw up a yellow hare that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide, open, silent, its eyes standing out. Hughes provides us with really vivid imagery here of this hare suffering, this innocent creature of nature being killed by war. So it's a hare that dies, but it doesn't have to literally be a hare, it could be a metaphor. It could be a metaphor for the boy's innocence. Now, as I've said before, Hughes's poetry focuses on countryside images a lot. This hare um, it's clearly a rural image rather than an urban image. It's an image of the countryside and it's almost like something natural as being killed. I think you can read that as a hare being killed and it's horrible and sad. Or you can read it as the boy, the soldier in the poem, his own innocence being killed here. So he sees this event happen and it, it changes him because the final five lines lack all of the uncertainty at the beginning. The uncertainty at the beginning suddenly stumbling, green hedge, tear that had brimmed. Now, by the end of the poem, he's a machine of war. Let's look at him. He plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge. There's the green hedge again. But look at the difference. Green hedge in line three, stumbling across a field of clods. Green hedge in line 19, he plunged past. You've probably guessed that I'm obsessed with verbs, so I'm gonna talk about the verb again here. Plunged is a verb which has connotations of certainty and violence, but possibly also a lack of control. We don't get the sense of the soldier just mar marching along. He's throwing himself at this battle now. He plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge. King, honour, human dignity. Reference to like the patriotism things from line seven. All the things he went to war for. King, honour, human dignity dropped like luxuries. 
drop like luxuries because they're unimportant. One way you can tell they're unimportant is the way Hughes uses, the Hughes uses this word, etc. Now think about how we use the word etc. When we're like listing a list of things that don't matter anymore. So um, you might think, you might be describing a day you've been on. You said, oh yeah, I did this and then I went there and then I went there, etc, etc. And it means you're just not important to you. And that's what these things that were so important to the soldier at the start of the, po at the poem, who had a patriotic tear, they've now totally left him. They're dropped like luxuries in a rather alarming here, yelling alarm to get out of that blue, blue crackling air. His terrors, touchy dynamite. Look, there's another reference there. We've got to machinery. So what, what the man, the soldier's been turned into by the end of this poem, he's gone from being this, this boy really uncertain of what war is to being by the end an unstoppable killing machine. killing machine. Now, when I say unstoppable killing machine, I don't mean the boy can be killed. Sorry, I don't mean the boy can't be killed. I mean that he can't be changed from his focus until he is killed. And I think ultimately that's what Hughes is saying war does to men. It turns them into unstoppable killing machines. Let's just look at that middle stanza again, because it's got a really fascinating piece of imagery for me. Probably the hardest three lines of poetry I had to decipher when we first got this anthology of poetry is these three here. And it took me a long time to work it out, but I think I've got it now. Let's go with that. In bewilderment, then, he almost stopped. Bewilderment means confusion. So it goes with some of the ideas up here. He almost stopped, but he doesn't. Then Hughes writes, a, he writes a question. Question mark there. In what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? Let's break it down. In what cold clockwork? Clockwork is unstoppable. It's some, We cannot stop time. So we have to have a sense of clockwork. A, being machinery, which we talked about before. B, being something unstoppable. So we've got, in what cold clockwork, time is unstoppable. The stars... Fate is unstoppable. The nations, the country's will is unstoppable. Was he the hand pointing that second? So the sense that the boy realises he's caught in an inescapable trap. It's a trap. To quote Admiral Akbar. It's a trap. Um, he has no way out because he can't stop time. He has no way out because he can't change destiny. He has no way out because he can't really sway the countries and what they want. But Hughes's phrasing is interesting. If it was, in what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was the hand pointing at him? Now, if the finger of fate is pointing at you, that probably means it's your turn to die. So if the finger of fate was pointing at him, that would mean that time, destiny, and the countries have told him it's your turn to die. But that's not the way it works. Hughes writes, in what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? He's not about to die. He's about to be the killer. He becomes the instrument of fate, of destiny, of the nations, and he himself becomes the killer. So going back to the end there, where well, he becomes a killing machine. To summarise, bayonet in Bayonet Charge, Hughes is telling us that war takes innocent ordinary men and turns them into machines of war, killing machines. Hughes is also suggesting that war has a terrifying and terrible effect on nature and is absolutely destructive. Is Hughes pro-war, anti-war? I think there's probably an anti-war tone to this, but he doesn't spell it out for us in the same way that Wilfred Owen does, that Simon Armitage does. It's a bit more neutral and a bit, dare I say, cleverer what he used does. Okay, thank you. I hope you found that useful. That's everything.